two things. There's truth and love. And, and you know, both of those words are even hard to say because they've been mouthed to death. But, but they have, in some sense, they have a deep technical meaning. And if you know that, then it kind of reignites their power. And love is the decision that being is worthwhile and should, and that you should struggle to support and improve it. And that's not a trivial thing because being is rife with suffering. You know, everyone dies, everyone gets sick. Like it's, it's brutal, it's brutal. And it's easy to turn against it. And so the idea that you're going to voluntarily accept responsibility for that, assume that it's good or act as if it's good and try to improve it is no trivial matter. And that means you have to scour out the resentment and the arrogance and the deceit in, in primarily. And, and it's sort of based on this idea, I would say, is like, well, life is very hard, obviously, but we're not doing everything we could to make it better. And we're often doing things to make it worse. So even if it is suffering, which is true, we have no idea how much we could ameliorate that if we all put our efforts into it. And so that's a genuine question. It's like, yeah, there's reasons to shake your fist and curse God. I mean, everyone ends up in a situation like that. Someone they love gets a terrible illness and disintegrates before their eyes, you know. And maybe they're a really good person and they've done nothing you would think of to deserve that. And, you know, that terrible fate is visited upon them. It's very difficult not to get cynical and angry under such circumstances. But then, well, that takes you down a very bad road if you do that. But it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't change the fundamental question. It's like, if your life isn't everything you think it should be, you have to ask yourself if you're doing everything you can. Because you actually don't get to make a judgment about the structure of being until you do everything you can. And I would say that's love, essentially. That's the decision. And then truth is the best, the best strategy with regards to that attainment. And how, how could it be otherwise? Like, if you're going to contend with reality, you bloody well better know what it is. You know, and truth isn't your grandmother's, you know, your, your, your too tight-laced grandmother's moral finger wagging. It's like the truth of existence is brutal and bitter. And so to be able to face that and, and to admit to the things that you are and to, and to communicate them with other people, especially in an intimate relationship, it's like that's, that's no cowardly morality. That's not the morality of cowardice, quite the contrary. You know, Nietzsche said you could assess the spirit of a man by determining how much truth he could tolerate. It's like, that's, that's, the, right, that's the right way of thinking about truth. Well, you opened this whole podcast with some truth. It's like, who wants to hear that? You know, and people think, oh, that's so terrible, and they don't think, well, could I be one of those ISIS guys? It's like, I can tell you, if you're bitter enough, Especially if you hate women, you know, because they've rejected you because you're such so goddamn useless that no woman in their right mind would look at you twice. You know, that'll generate plenty of bitterness in your soul. And if you don't think that you could act like that under those conditions, then you're not even watching your own fantasies. So, truth in the service of the betterment of being, it's something like that. And that's that's enough to give your life meaning. I don't care where you start. Like, I had this kid come and visit me a while back, and he had never left his home state. And he was, I think he was 19, and he was overprotected and oversheltered, and he was a smart kid, and so, of course, he also thought that the world really hadn't appreciated his gifts, which is a very common feeling for smart kids who, who aren't getting anywhere, right? They get really angry about that. And then he decided that he was going to move out of his house and he took a job as a dishwasher and he said he tried to do a good job as a dishwasher it's like good that's some humility it's just a dishwashing job but you know you can be a good dishwasher and then the restaurant runs better and then it's kind of fun as long as the people you're working with are half decent you can make good social relationships and then you can learn to be social which was happening to him and then maybe they let you be a short order cook you know, and, and you got a bit of a clue, and then you have a bit of money, and you have a little independence, and it's a lot better than being at home and being bitter and resentful and immature, you know. It's just a dishwashing job. Well, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. It's like, it's, it's the first door that's open to you. 
you know, and then he came up to Toronto. He'd, he'd never been out of his home state, so it was a big deal for him to come to another city. And when he first came to talk to me, he was outside of one of my lectures. He couldn't even speak. He was so nervous because he had pretty high levels of social anxiety. So he was tongue-tied. And I invited him to come over to my house to talk to him because I knew there was something up with him. And he told me this story, you know, and I thought, well, you know, that's the beginnings of a heroic journey. He was able to humble himself enough so that, you know, if you're low, if you're in a low place, it's a low door that's going to open. And you might think, I'm too high to crawl through that low door. Jung said, Carl Jung said, people, modern people don't see God because they don't look low enough. I really like that idea. But that's it. If you're in a low place, the opportunity that presents itself to you is going to be low. And it's going to be very tempting to you because you're arrogant, resentful to say, well, that's not good enough for me. It's like, well, do you have an alternative? If, if you don't have an alternative, then an in shop is up. And it's the right trajectory, you know, and so that's humility. That's humility. It's like you're low. You take what you take what's given to you and you see if you can make it work. And the thing is, that works way faster than people think, even because I worked as a dishwasher when I was a kid, you know, for a year, for a year or so. And it was really hard to begin with because I didn't know what I was doing. And the German chef, who's kind of a tough guy, just let me flounder around for two weeks to see if I would quit. So I was there till like three in the morning and I was 13, I think. I couldn't wash all these damn dishes. I thought it was impossible. I told my dad at one point, I said, I don't know if I can do this. It's like I'm working as hard as I can and they keep piling up, you know, but I didn't stop. And then the German cook, you know, who had been treating me pretty harshly at one day, he said, okay, I'll show you how to do this. And then he showed me how to organize the dishes and everything. And it was like, Pfft. That was not no problem. I could do it in like 10% of the time. So then I cleaned up the rest of the kitchen. I had a good time mucking about with the chefs and we played around a lot back there. And I ended up working as a short order cook and I learned to cook and all of that. And that was a good part of my adolescence. But, but the thing is, so the thing is, is that those trivial jobs, it's the conception of their triviality that makes them trivial. They're not trivial. Not if you do them right.